Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar on to batch or not to batch. That is a question. I'm Alan Sung, the moderator for this webinar session, and currently serving as part of the Escalite Executive and organizing this series of Escalite webinars this year. I also like to introduce my fellow Escalite Executive, who is part of the Escalite webinar team, Mark North Over. This afternoon, we are very glad to have Joyce uh, Sissinger to facilitate this one hour webinar on open badges. Joyce has worked in higher education in Australia and New Zealand. She's a learner experience designer, open badges advocate, digital presence coach, and founder of Academic Tribe. With a network of distributed education specialists, she has worked on projects for education and research organizations. Joyce also co-facilitated the Open Badges Australia and New Zealand Community Group. For this afternoon's one hour webinar, the presenter will be sharing for a number of minutes and thereafter, there will be activities for you to work on. If you have any questions during the session, you could post your question in the chat box. During the question and answer session, you can also click onto the hand raising button located on the left right below the image box and I'll give you the right to speak. When speaking, you can click onto the talk button. After speaking, you can release the button. Without further ado, please help me to welcome Joyce. Hello everyone, um, uh, and I think I probably know, oh, thank you for the applause, <laughs> um, I think I probably know everyone in the room, hi everyone, and I've probably talked about badges with several of you. Um, so um, I actually went through the trouble of doing my makeup for today and then realized that I wasn't going to be using the video. So anyway, you will all know that I actually made the effort. Um, so thanks, Alan, for that kind introduction, and, and thanks to you and Mark and Ascalite for asking me to, to talk about this today. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, my presentation, the presentation part of today, is really aimed at just making sure that we're all talking the same language, that, we're all, that we've all got a common understanding of badges, and also to highlight some examples, but not really going to them specifically, but to highlight some examples of badge use in higher education. And then after that, I would like to have an open discussion because in no way, shape, or form am I saying that I am the uh, end all be all expert on badges. I think it is a very new um, uh, concept in teaching and learning in education institutions. And I think it's something that everybody is, is feeling their way through. And with Academic Tribe, we're doing some work with clients who are not in education, who are in training and development, and it's the same story there. So, um, so I'm really keen for the conversation part. So in order to make sure that I stay on track, um, I'm just going to set a timer for myself so that I don't keep talking about badges without ever getting to talk to you. So I just want to make sure that I don't do that. Um, okay, so um, uh, to badge or not to badge, that is the question. And uh, so like I said, I'm going to try to get us all kind of on the same page. But uh, before that, what I would like you to do is just do a short little activity with me. Um, and what I'd like you to do is to uh, sketch a badge uh, for yourself, just like in a minute, you know, on a piece of note paper or a post-it that you've got in front of you. I'd like you to sketch a badge for a skill that you've learned in the last six months. Something that you taught yourself or that you, t that you learned somewhere else and that you would have liked to have received a badge for. And um, uh, if you're on Twitter, then it would be really nice if you could share it there and tweet it with, uh, with the hashtag Ascalite. So, um, so you've all got uh, a minute to just sketch a badge of your own and then hopefully I'll see them pop up in my tweet deck um, as they get shared. So anything that you've learned in the last six months that you would have liked to have been uh, awarded a badge for, but didn't. I've got a timer in here that I can actually set up as well. Start timer, count down from one. There we go. So in my case, it would probably be, what have I learned lately that I would have liked to have gotten a, a badge for? 
I went to a wireframing workshop in, where I spent about eight hours coming to grips with various mock-up tools, and it was a really well-facilitated session. And uh, I think I learned a lot, and I've since used those skills uh, quite a few times in my work. Um, and yet, I've got nothing to show for that day. So if you go to my LinkedIn profile, you wouldn't be able to know that that is a skill that I've now got, or at least a skill that I've got at a very low level and that I'm actively practicing. All right, so you should have those badges ready, and, uh, and do tweak them if you can. And I'm just going to turn the timer off. Okay, so getting into uh, how open badges actually work. So most of you will be familiar with and have a document that looks a little bit like this. What you see here is my high school diploma, and it's very elaborate, and it's got lots of pretty pictures, and it's got beautiful calligraphy. It's from my uh, American high school um, in Cairo, Egypt, because um, American high schools don't do anything halfway. Uh, but basically, all that this is, uh, and this is a great thought by Doug Belshaw, all that those, that those diplomas are is they are basically just an offline badge. Now, uh, you'll see a few of these uh, little sketch notes as we go through today's presentation. They are by an incredibly talented guy named Brian Mathers, who's been doing uh, a really great job in the Open Badges community in order to visualize these conversations that we're all having with each other. So I just want to give him a little bit of a plug, and I've, I've included his blog uh, links there uh, where you can go and find all of his work. He's really amazing, and he's working together with Doug Belshaw, who used to be part of the Mozilla team that worked on Open Badges. But basically, when you think about your own diploma, and um, I can tell you, this one usually lives at the bottom of my closet. Um, it, uh, it is a, um, it, you know, I hardly ever get to share it. I think the last time I actively shared it with anyone uh, was when I immigrated to New Zealand, or maybe when I immigrated to, to Australia. But basically, this never sees the light of day, and that's because it's actually quite hard to, to, to share. I have to, uh, I'd have to make a copy. Then it would just be a paper copy. How would anybody know that it's actually trustworthy? Um, and, uh, and I can scan it, and then I can send it to someone. And essentially, that's where we're moving into this whole kind of digital badge idea, this idea of a, of a badge or certificate being a visual representation of a skill or achievement. And then if you look at the idea of a digital badge, it is that it is a digital credential that represents a skill, interest, or an achievement that a, an individual, an earner, earns through specific projects, programs, courses, or other activities. It doesn't have to be through formal education. So when we look at the digital badge landscape, there's lots of issuers of digital badges, right? Code Academy has its own internal digital badge system that it uses. Um, if you're learning a second language, like Duolingo, my partner is currently learning how to speak Dutch, uh, uh, Duolingo uses the gamification system of badges in order to get you through learning another language. If you're an avid TripAdvisor participant, then you may have seen badges, you may have been awarded a badge by a TripAdvisor um, for reviews that you've written. So uh, you can become a hotel specialist or you can become a restaurant expert. And if you've worked for Deloitte, then you might have been issued a badge uh, by uh, Deloitte, who set up a leadership academy, and they um, have, a sh have their own showcase and they issue digital badges through that. Of course, the big problem with all of these internal badge systems is that those badges don't travel very well. When you want to take them with you, you, uh, you can't really take them with you. They're tied to that system. And, uh, and this is where Mozilla came in, and Mozilla's Open Badges project. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to make it easy for people to get recognition for skills and achievements that happen online or that happen out of school, that happen somewhere else than informal education, basically to recognize learning wherever it happens. And so they work on something called the uh, OBI, or OBI, and that's not this Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> uh, but the OBI stands for the Open Badges Infrastructure, and it's basically a standard that, um, uh, that will let all of the different parts in an uh, Open Badge ecosystem talk to each other uh, so that a badge can travel from one system into another system. And so what we're seeing is that it's really not something new, and here's another beautiful sketch note from Brian Mathers, but, uh, but what we're doing with Open Badges, it's actually an old concept, and it's actually an old education concept that has worked very, very well in the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. Uh, but what we're adding to it is this built-in digital audit trail, a way of actually 
um, making those um, badges have contain more information than the physical object actually can. Um, and and hopefully go into spaces where uh, it, that are outside of formal education, where people uh, might not necessarily uh, be that successful in, in in getting these large credentials that we issue, but they may be successful in 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 getting rewarded for skills that they already have or skills that they're learning. So, um, one of the problems that I've run into in uh, higher education, but also in talking to people who work in uh, corporate training, is that they get quite, people get quite fussy about the name. So this is my attempt at a sketch note, which is nowhere near as pretty as what Brian does. But, um, but basically, these are some of the different, war, uh, different names that I've seen for, for badges. We've got, oh, we can't call them badges. They're, it's too infantile. It's too schoolish. Um, so I've heard them called insignia, which is a bit Star Trekish. I've heard them called nano degrees, micro credentials, digital credentials, and even medallions. So uh, people go to great lengths to actually change the name of the badges, but I think that by uh, any other name, they are still basically badges. And what goes into the making of a badge? This is a, uh, a Creative Commons image that was created by Kyle Bowen, who is at Purdue University. And basically, any badge is, in its essence, just an image file. It's a PNG file. But into that PNG file, is this uh, gets added this uh, metadata, and and the process of actually putting that metadata into the file is called baking a badge, right? So you've got uh, so some of the metadata that gets added to the badge at that point are things like the badge name, the description, the criteria. What did the earner have to do in order to earn that badge? The issuer, who is the issuing organization or person? And then it's also possible to add a link to the evidence that shows that that earner actually met the criteria. So this is where you can start to see a really strong correlation between portfolios and badges. Um, it can also contain the date issued, and then it works together with all of these standards. OK. Now, you may already have some badge powers because um, uh, several of the learning management systems actually shifted over about two years ago. I think it was 2013. Moodle was the first. <laughs> you know, I still have a warm heart for Moodle. Moodle was the first. But, um, oh, actually, no, I should say Totrail was the first, but I don't work with Totrail. Uh, but, to, uh, uh, but that was then uh, translated into Moodle. And Blackboard and Canvas also have badge powers. And so, uh, it depends, of course, whether your administrator has actually turned that on or not, because in some cases, the way that uh, people get badge powers inside the LMS is not very discriminate, and institutions do get worried about people just awarding, I don't know, University of Melbourne badges willy-nilly, so, uh, which is totally understandable. So, but you, your LMS may already be able to, um, to, to issue badges, but there are other options as well for issuing badges. Uh, there's Badge OS, uh, which is a, uh, a plugin to WordPress, and that also works closely together with Credly. Credly is probably, I would say, the largest um, issuer at the moment. Uh, it is a, you can just go to www.credly.com and you could be issuing a badge like in the next five minutes. Um, and some other issue, issuing platforms, uh, Badge List has recently come on the market. They focus specifically on um, education and training. So um, if that's the kind of thing that you're looking at, um, that might be something that you want to look at. Um, and uh, there is Badge Kit, which was actually created by the Mozilla team, but I believe that at the moment it is not under active development. And that might be just because uh, commercial um, entities have kind of bypassed it. Um, and then one of the other things that has come out of that, um, of, out of the success, really, of the Mozilla team that work on the open badges is that most of that team have now moved into an entity called the Badge Alliance. And you can find all about the Badge Alliance at badgealliance.org. And um, uh, this is where they support working groups and support people in setting up new badge projects, but also into doing research, research into open badges and um, how they can change um, whole industries. So um, they've got working groups that they support. And so if you're interested in doing more work on badges, Badge Alliance would be the place to start. 
And, uh, and other good news for Open Badges is that earlier this year, in April, it was announced that the IMS Global Learning Consortium has decided that they are going to endorse the Open Badge Infrastructure Standard. Uh, so that's a really big push and, uh, in terms of getting recognition for that standard. Okay, so how do they work in practice, right? Like, so what actually happens with these badges? Um, well, basically, you've got four stakeholders in, uh, in the open badge ecosystem. You have the earner. This is the person who earns the badge. You have the issuer, uh, so, uh, who is the issuing organization or person that issues. Um, you have the displayer. The displayer is uh, the stakeholder who agrees to uh, display badges on their platform. So, for instance, LinkedIn would be a displayer, or a blogging platform like WordPress would be a displayer. And uh, you've got an au uh, the audience. This is the people who would actually be looking at badges. And so these can be employers. Uh, they can be potential collaborators. For instance, a very interesting thing that just came across my feed uh, the other day is um, uh, this a research journal which has decided that they're going to issue open badges to authors and reviewers for, um, for participating in the editing process of their journal. So, um, so, you know, there are, so who would be the audience for that? Well, the audience for that would be other people who might want to collaborate with that person. So um, the way it works is that basically you can, once there is an, a mature ecosystem, is that you could earn badges in lots of different places, right? So you can get it for on-the-job training, you can get it for online learning, uh, you can get it through a volunteer program. You collect all of those badges, and then they go into a badge backpack. And uh, the badge backpack, well, Mozilla has set one up called the, uh, called the Open Badge Backpack. Actually, this is not that. This is the backpack that you get given in Credly because the backpack is a what they call a federated technology. So you can actually move your badges from different backpacks. Um, of course, the best practice is for you to just create one yourself. Uh, create one and, and, and make that your main backpack and collect all of your badges into one backpack. Um, another example, uh, one that's actually just come, uh, come up and, and has recently been developed, is uh, Open Badge Passport, which is created by the guys from Open Badge Factory up in Finland. And um, that is proving to be, um, that, I've, I've had a little bit of play with it. It's quite user friendly. And it also does nice things in terms of rendering the, the badges and, and, and importing them from other places. So, so if you're looking for where you're going to keep your, uh, Batch, uh, your badges, Open Badge Passport is, is I think, a, perhaps a little bit more user friendly than the Mozilla Open Backpack. Once the badges are in your backpack, you are then able to send them to these displayer type sites. And so these will be sites like Facebook, Twitter, WordPress, your website. And from there, there will be then be other people who are your audience, and they will be able to uh, view those badges. Um, and that can lead to job opportunities. Uh, you know, it gives you a map of your lifelong learning. It shows you, you know, where you've gone. And by looking at other badges, you can actually start to see, like, which directions you might want to go in as well. So they kind of act like, like markers, you know, behind you, but they also act like way markers as something to, that you can set out for, you know. And, uh, and, and people um, can unlock new possibilities by saying, I actually did this course and I got this badge, or I got a MOOC and I got a badge. And so, um, so basically the idea is that you can give credit where credit is due, and, uh, and, and, you know, they look very different. But people can issue badges through lots of different platforms. These are all uh, credly credly ones, but they're given by different organizations. So in a way, what we're developing with badges seems to be a little bit like learning currency. And that's what you'll find all the time when you actually um, start to engage with the badges and start to read some of the badge articles, is that there's this kind of economic lingo that seems to have crept into how people talk about badges. Um, and I think there are similarities. So on, on the one hand, um, you know, badges depend on trust. So um, they, it is the trust between the earner and the issuing organization, and also the trust between the audience and the issuing organization. Depend, you know, they create the value of, of the badge, and that's similar to how we think about our currency. You know, we, depend, we believe that this piece of paper is worth X 
because we have faith in the issuing organization. And uh, it also depends on the criteria and the evidence. This whole idea of trust and evidence in, in badges is, is something that gets quite complicated and there are lots of different parts to it. Uh, but, but basically the value, one of the, one of the things that determines the value of the badge is how well the criteria for the badge were put together and how well the evidence is presented and shared as well. And another way that they are similar to currency is that they can be granular with different denominations. So you could earn five smaller badges, say, um, something that I use it for is personal learning networks, you know, you know how to set up a personal identity, you know how to set up personal information streams, you know, those are all small ones. And then the larger one is you have achieved uh, the setting up of a personal learning network. So they can fit together and they can be, um, they can basically be stackable. So you can get Twitter, Facebook, blog, YouTube, and then the larger badges, you are a social ninja. So, um, so a badge's worth is, as I said, quite complicated. You know, there is the issuer value, um, you know, who, who actually issued it. Uh, there is the meaning value, what do we actually think that badge stands for. Then there is um, this new thing which technologically is still quite difficult to do, but this idea of um, institutions endorsing each other's, um, endorsing each other's badges. So for instance, say that Ascolite said, as part of our PD, we're going to start issuing people with badges, then um, Ascolite member institutions could say, we're going to endorse those Ascolite badges. Now obviously this is a wonderful idea uh, philosophically, but, but how that would work technically is still a little ways away. Um, and then also the, the, the journey, uh, the, the value of the journey that you have to do, the work that you have to do, the actual learning journey that the earner had in order to get to that point where they were ready to submit their evidence. So, so the worth of a badge can be different, different things. And when you have a conversation with people about badges and the value of badges, I think it's important to get where they're actually coming from when they, when they say something like, oh, badges are just, you know, stickers or badges are, are um, you know, what's a badge really worth? Um, there are lots of different facets to that. Um, so one of the things to do is to really focus then on the badge design. And uh, I won't go into this, but I do just want to share it with you. Um, uh, if we went into it, we would be spending too long on it. Uh, but this is basically the, uh, the badge canvas, and it is a way of doing the learning design that needs to happen in order for you to design a well thought out badge. Uh, it was created by the guys from Digital Me. Uh, and you can download it online, it's basically everywhere. You can also adjust it for your own needs if you like for your own institution. Uh, but I found it's a really valuable way of thinking your way through badges. So if you're thinking about doing some work with colleagues, I would, uh, I would definitely um, uh, recommend this, this canvas. Um, but to, to me, the badges really get interested, interesting when you start thinking about badge system design. So not the one badge by itself. Uh, but actually how the badges all fit together and how the badges that you offer can offer different pathways for your learners. Um, this is a, a diagram created by Carla Casilli, uh, who was part of the original Mozilla uh, team and is now gone to the Badge Alliance. Uh, but basically this idea that the learner, that you might create the badge and you might create, and, and in a recent blog post she talked about this idea of a constellation of badges. Um, but it is the, the learner who actually chooses their learning path through that constellation. And uh, I think that is an incredibly evocative system and very far away from the rather limited options that, that we usually give learners in, in formal education uh, where there are quite a few um, just predetermined um, modules that people have to do and then there might be a few electives. Uh, this seems like a much more open system and also a system that someone could go out of and come back into again, uh, which is also quite appealing. Um, and a badge system doesn't necessarily only need to be created at the top. Um, you can actually, uh, they can be quite alive and vibrant and dynamic. Um, so you might have um, organization created and owned badges that are predetermined at the top and then spread through the organization or made available to the organization. But uh, at the same time, for instance, a, a school of biology might determine that they need badges about how to work in labs in a way that, um, you know, the school of uh, 
English lit might not need. So, um, so in that case, you um, at the department level, you might need different badges than you might do at the top. And then there's also this opportunity for um, individual and community created and owned badges. Once you've set up the badge system, why wouldn't you allow the other parts inside your academic community? Things like I'm thinking about the um, student union or I'm thinking about uh, uh, peer mentoring systems, et cetera. Why wouldn't you allow them to use the technology that you've put in place in order to start credentialing the learning that happens in those spaces and the, and the skills that are built in those spaces as well? Um, so something else to think about that's interesting uh, in terms of the uh, of, of building badge systems when, when, where, where they get a bit more complex is this idea that there seems to be a taxonomy that is emerging in terms of the badges. Um, they, they're, they're, there are different facets to uh, why people issue badges and, 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 and all of these different facets can be together, in, can live side by side with each other inside your, your badge system. So you can have some badges that will be about potential, some badges that are about participation, and some badges, for instance, that are about commitment or that are just for encouragement. Um, and they can also be issued for different types of activities, which is what you see in the process column. So that's a very interesting aspect to badge systems as well. One of the things that I've talked about is this idea, and this is borrowed from the Lean Startup Cycle. Um, so if, you, if you've done anything around Lean Startup or you've done any reading around it, you'll be familiar with the um, Build, Measure, Learn Cycle. And in my thinking, that actually works really well for badge systems. So this idea that you would build a few badges you put them out into the field, then you measure how much people actually use them or how they use them. You learn from that, and that will give you more ideas about the kind of badges that you want. And you want to have it be a really participatory design. Now, I have also heard from people who have been involved in, uh, in, in building badge systems who say, I don't think that's a valid way to go because you don't want to be issuing people with badges that are just exploratory. Um, I think there is something to be said for both sides of that coin. But, um, but I think, I guess what I'm saying is, don't over-engineer it at the front. You can start small and then expect to scale up later. Um, and one of the other things to consider when you're thinking about uh, in, uh, implementing a bad system is that you want to consider the larger ecosystem that you're working in. Um, so there are many, many um, uh, organizations that have signed up to, uh, to support that badges and also to support the issuing of badges. And so for this, this is uh, mainly from the UK, but as you can see, there are a lot of people that are working together. So don't design your badge system in isolation. There might be badges already out there that your organization could simply endorse or that your organization could build on. I think one of the more interesting ones that we heard through OBANs was the badge system at Qual IT, which is a um, a software testing company, and they decided to use the overarching skills framework for their for their industry in order to um, uh, to use that as the lead for their badges. So you're not designing in isolation, and you shouldn't be designing in isolation. Look around you. Look what frameworks or other systems there are that you can actually start to tap into. And so this gets me to my final bit, which is around the higher ed badge projects and ideas. Just a quick, um, you know, passing by, flyby, really, of some things that you might want to be looking into. Uh, the most well-known example of badges at a university um, uh, at a university level is uh, Purdue University, who were very early. Um, uh, in the game here, they rolled this out. I know that they were presenting on it at a big conference in uh, 2012, and by that time, it was already very mature. So this is Purdue University, and they've called their badge system Passport. And if you go online, you'll be able to find lots of information about this. They've got an iPad app. It all looks very slick. They've obviously got very good design. And um, basically, any instructor can sign up to start issuing badges for their course. Um, here in Australia, we've got the Australian National University. This is my friend, uh, Dr. Inger Mewburn, who's director of research training there. And she ran a test project to look at um, issuing badges to students for research skills. And uh, she's kept an open blog. You can read up about that. But it was certainly a project that was very fraught um, uh, with difficulty just in terms of the process of adding this very new thing into the technological setup that was on campus. 
um, it there was just an incredible amount of red tape and uh, and Katie Freund has uh, uh, presented on this uh, most recently at uh, Moodle Moot here in Australia and uh, it is quite amazing just how many people go into and have to give permission in order to roll out something like badges. So I suppose there's some lessons in there in that in that if you're going to try to roll something like this out, um, uh, be prepared to be in it for the long haul. Um, uh, some interesting research has come out of um, the uh, uh, online uh, design um, MOOC that was called that was uh, run in the in the UK and the OLDS MOOC as it's known and they had these different badges and they did quite a bit of uh, research into looking at um, what their earners actually thought about those badges after they were issued with them and, uh, and it varied from people saying I really loved it, I didn't think I would love it but I did and people saying uh, I never cared about them and I never even went to claim mine. Um, so there's some really interesting uh, data coming from there. And then there's some very interesting projects happening um, here in Australia. Uh, this is by Deakin who have set up a separate entity called Deakin Digital. And these are open credentialing services that still use the OBI standard, uh, but you'll note that they call them credentials. And basically their idea is to issue credentials to anybody who wants them that are aligned with the university's graduate learning outcomes, but also with the Australian qualifications framework and industry skill frameworks. So they're setting themselves up to start to offer people recognition for learning that they did elsewhere. And that recognition can then lead to you moving into a pathway that will move you in the direction of Deakin. So, uh, so that's a very interesting development. Open Badge Academy is, um, hasn't even launched yet. It's, it's launching later this year. This is coming out of, um, out of the, out of Europe. And, um, uh, what's interesting at this is, this is, this is an open approach to doing something that, uh, Deacon is doing in a closed proprietary way. Uh, but this is an open approach, um, in order to enable people to start issuing badges at an academic level. And Open Badge Exchange is really interesting as well because Open Badge Exchange is a place where people can go and submit badges that they've earned elsewhere that were perhaps by less esteemed uh, badge issuers and you can go there and try to exchange them for more advanced badges. Uh, so maybe you got a, um, oh, we just had the red moon. Uh, maybe you got a, a, a badge issued by your local um, astronomy club and now you decide that you will want to go online and you've actually got a whole bunch of badges and you might want to exchange them for a badge from NASA. So that's where that's aiming at and but again it's quite immature. So we have a few challenges ahead of us which is that um, uh, if these badges are going to sit out there on their own in this large ecosystem what kind of learning experience are we going to design and offer people? And also, at some point, we're going to have to deal with people with, who have badges who are coming into our institutions. Okay, so there's a lot to take in there, and there are a lot of challenges for us there. Uh, but I think, you know, and, and we see a lot of competition, you know, like universities are, are, are starting to move into the space where they're seeing this as one place where they could compete or where they could get ahead or where they could set themselves apart. But I think what we need to do is to keep in mind who this really can benefit. And I think that the badges and the open badges and the, the rise of the open badges really fits into this idea by Joy Eco, which is that the way that we do education is now different. And what we instead are trying to do is that we're, we're wanting our learners to establish themselves as this node in a broad network. Um, of distributed creativity. And that's where the badges can really help. And that's where you know, what we're trying to do when we set up badge systems is we're not just setting up our patch, badge system, but we are adding to this constellation that, um, that learners can then choose from. Okay, so with that, I am open to throwing it open to questions. Hi. Now, um, Alan, are you happy for me to, uh, to lead the next part as well? Because my thinking was that what we would do is do a um, thinking hat conversation. And uh, this, is my, uh, this is my facilitator. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks, Mark. Um, this is my facilitator background coming back to haunt me. 
Um, but because uh, what I find is that when I do workshops on open badges, uh, people come from all sorts of sides um, uh, in order to kind of talk about badges, and and people, and some people immediately go to visual design, some people immediately go to um, to how difficult it will be to implement technologically, et cetera. So I thought rather than just kind of throwing it out into the open, we might actually do it hat by hat. And um, and I thought that what would be interesting is um, if we started with uh, the white hat. So put your white hats on, and um, think about um, you know what I've just told you, and what are some other facts or information that you have that you would like to share with us, or what are some other facts or information that that you would be after in order to uh, to know more about badges. And I'm happy to either take talk, uh, take questions in the um, in the chat window, or um, also you can. Um, Alan will probably give you um, talking rights. Thanks very much, Joyce. Okay, um, anyone would like to uh, ask a question? You could be in the chat box, or uh, you can even just put up your hand, and we'll give you the right to speak. Oh, Mark Northover has a question here. Uh, it's in the chat box. Okay, so um, so your question there, Mark, is a very slow uptake. What is it that triggers people? It's a problem. It's a bit of a black hat question, really. But okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, uh, well, so if I stick to the data and the facts, uh, what we see actually is that there is quite a bit of uptake um, in uh, in the states. Um, uh, again, probably not at the university level, but the Badge Alliance and Mozilla have done uh, a lot of work on the Cities of Learning project. Uh, they've now got 11 Cities of Learning online. And um, these are projects that take a city by city approach. And what they do is they start to recognize people. Um, and I think I've got a, um, I think I've got a link for it here. Yes, I do. There we go. Uh, they've got a cities of learning approach, and so they work with with cities in order to um, to give after school education programs, holiday education programs, um, other types of hobbies, maker spaces, etc., to give them the ability to start issuing credentials. So basically, these cities of learning projects actually set up the technology, set up the training, and provide training in badge design and learning design as well. Uh, but what they're doing is they're not setting up new educational programs. Rather, they are giving existing informal education programs the ability to start issuing badges. And like I said, they start, it started with Chicago city, uh, city of Learning, but now they've actually expanded to 11 other cities. And so there's quite a bit of uptake. And these aren't small cities. We're talking like LA and Boston. You know, so it's quite big. Uh, and uh, and so we're just not seeing that here. I, I did make a throw at it um, last year at uh, Melbourne Knowledge City, and I actually even went to talk to the people at City of Melbourne. Um, but it would take some political uh, people to get on board with it, and I think I would also need to have like a university on board in order to uh, to kind of support that kind of a program. So um, so it's interesting. So so there is slow uptake here. Um, and maybe it's because we're in a bit more of a competitive thing uh, in a competitive um, ecosystem. I'm not sure. Uh, hi, Joyce. There's a question here. Um, what would you advise? What is your advice would be uh, for any departments or small institutions um, who are keen to embark on this, but they are not sure how to start? Uh, just, just any uh, uh, thoughts about that? Thanks. Yeah, sure, Alan. Um, if you're a small institution and you're not sure where to start, well, we're actually working with a small institution right now. Um, and um, really, the way to go forward is simply um, is to talk to people who've done it before. So um, get set up and, and get talking to people who've done it before. Um, but also, what you'll find is that it is 
something that you just have to start working on. It's not something where you're going to find, and that's where my where I think that that my thoughts with the with the lean startup cycle came from, uh, which is that you're not going to get it right straight away. Um, but and what what for instance we're doing with our system is we're using Credly, which is a which is a very usable uh, uh, user friendly system. And it's not very expensive um, for an organization to sign on. It's about $450 a year. Um, so if you're issuing batches to like, you know, 500 learners, that's not a lot. And um, um, we're using, we're using, so we're using a very user-friendly system. And uh, and what we're doing is we're uh, we're doing some testing. Uh, we're doing um, uh, user testing. We're we're not rolling the whole thing out to everyone straight away. We've approached people by invitation and said, look, we're trying to streamline this process. Would you try claiming these batches for us, please? And this is for work that you've already done. So we're now just adding a service for you. And uh, and 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 that looks like it's going to go really well. And it's going to give us some data in order to to see how people uh, what people think. I think very important is that you that you don't design in isolation. So that participatory design is very important. Talk to your stakeholders and see what people think. Thanks very much, Joyce. OK, so, um, so Red Hat then. Uh, we're on to feelings. Um, you know, what's people's gut instinct about this and their intuition? You know, are you excited? How, are, how, how do badges make you feel? And uh, feel free to just start popping it into the chat window over there. Thanks, Becca. That's, that's very interesting. Um, sounds cool. All right. Excited, interested, nervous, and frustrated. I'd love to hear more about your frustration, Sue. Badges could eventually replace calls. Um, interesting, Becca. I actually think that um, you know what is to stop universities um, at this moment. Like, if you're if you're thinking about the SAMR model, you know where um, where the lowest level is where you're just um, um, uh, you know doing what you've always done, but now you do it digitally. Um, you know that's what we could do. We could still give people their paper certificates, but we could also start issuing them with the digital equivalent. Um, you know, I've long said that when I buy the physical, a physical book, I would love there to be a code in there that just immediately allows me to go and download the, the equivalent ebook. I'm sure the publishers won't ever do that. But, I said, but it, it's a similar kind of thing that we could be doing with credentials. You know, when I get issued my, my, um, my diploma, um, after one or two years of study, uh, I should be able to go to LinkedIn and immediately see that uh, my university or my um, polytechnic has also issued me with a badge on my LinkedIn page. Um, all right, I'm just going to go and read through this chat because I can't read and talk at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, badges could easily be a value add. Yeah, um, exactly, Colin. Uh, frustration in implementing it, implementing in a tightly regulated workspace. Yeah, Sue, so that's really interesting. And one of the things that I wanted to share a slide with you guys with, and I actually forgot, but one of the things that we had to do for the client that we're working with is we, what we did is we actually mapped how they credential people currently, and we mapped every single step of the way. So it was basically their learner journey. And so we're using a lot of UX um, uh, methodologies in the way that we do learning design these days. And, and, and in this instance, it was really, really helpful because we mapped out the entire learning journey and we mapped it out in different bands. So what does the issuer do? What does the learner do? What are the objects that we actually need? And then we decided on a way of issuing the badges that would actually tap into the already existing um, frameworks and the already existing uh, workflows, and I think that was really helpful in overcoming some of the um, um, some of the negativity that we were finding with the people that worked there. Yeah. Um, and Lee says not to be implemented by school or university, best implemented outside, like the cities of learning. Um, I agree, Lee, that that is where the really big potential is for badges. I would, um, I think that. Um, um, and I think there's also a risk 
in, in the university starting to go into this all gung-ho because then what we would do is we would just be recreating the existing trust networks that there already are when we know that really valuable uh, learning and achievement happens outside of our, uh, our outside of formal education. So, uh, but I would love to see more of a collaboration in that and I think it's one of these spaces where universities could be offering a service. Um, Potential is great and exciting, says Carol. Institutional red tape, yes, and just starting to play with them. And worries that people, by their nature, will confuse the object of the badge with the substance of learning achievement. Um, uh, I agree, Lee. There, there is that, um, particularly when people. It's very easy to make the leap to gamification. Um, and um, but I think uh, what can actually happen there is, or what I found is in designing the, um, the badges, so when we use that badge canvas, people actually end up focusing on the learning design and what the learner actually has to do before they get the badge. Um, and when that is designed really well, you sometimes come away with a much better learning activity than we would have otherwise designed, uh, where it might have consisted of read the PDF and then do the quiz. Um, when you then say to people, now, how would you actually know that the student has these skills? How would you actually know that they deserve this badge? People get much more specific and much more creative in the kind of evidence that they're looking for. So I found it almost a, a, a subversive way of doing really good learning design. It's been very interesting. Um, yeah, Colin, I agree. It's, uh, that's frustrating <laughs> in terms of red hat. Uh, it's frustrating because it's like it's right there for the taking. You could just map it. So, um, so that's really interesting. Okay, um, and which probably leads us a little bit into this black hat kind of thing. Uh, difficulties, potential problems. I know people have already talked about the red tape. Um, uh, one of the other things uh, that people quite often talk about when they talk about the problem with badges is that there will be this like badge proliferation where there's just this huge flood of badges that people get. Like at the moment I've probably got about 14 badges sitting in my backpack and most of them have been given by other people who are teaching badge workshops. So um, and then there's a few for um, conferences, speaking at a conference. Um, those are really useful. I like to display those. Um, and um, but but you know three years from now, if if that continues to grow, I could end up with 50 badges or 60 badges. How do you um, how do you continue to make sense of it? How do we keep it manageable for earners? So I definitely think that that is one of my black hat concerns. Um, and Colin says the ecosystem for displaying badges still isn't there. Um, I agree with that. I think and I think that's actually a dual system. I think is that the ecosystem for displaying badges isn't here and also the ecosystem for reading badges because remember all of these badges contain metadata and that can be read and so um, as an organization um, you could actually be reading for instance this could be a way of informing yourself about what kind of students are coming into your program right so let's say we're 10 years down the road and um, students register for your program in, let's say we've got a Masters of Education Technology. All of these students have already worked, they've already got different things. So what if they all log on to your learning management system and your learning management system is able to read their badges? They agree that the learning management system can read their badges. And then now what you've got as the lecturer or as the program director is you've actually got an idea about what kind of skills people are bringing into that course. And that can determine how you're going to teach that program as well. So I think there's some really interesting possibilities there in terms of the data, but currently those systems aren't there yet. Um, and a collection system that can join multiple IDs for students, i.e. their university one and their personal ones. Um, yeah, in some ways the, the backpacks tend to do that, Mark, because um, usually the, the, the unique identifier for the earners is their email addresses and most backpacks uh, will let you add different email addresses to the backpack. Um, uh, so, um, so you can then collect, you know, 
badges that have been issued to you in your different persona, you know, as joins that academic tribe, I tend to get different um, uh, badges sent to me from conferences, etc. And then I do as nz.catspajama. Um, so, um, but I can add both of those emails to my backpack, and 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 badges sent to both emails can be displayed there or can be important there. Um, but uh, but that's certainly you see that's something that at the moment is still quite like you need to be quite persistent about badge use in order to set that up and you need to be quite savvy you need to have quite a high level of badge literacy in order to be able to do that and um, and that's just um, and it's and it's not that easy yet you know so so you'd have to be thinking about that and I think anyone who would be less persistent not that interested might drift away so it's really something that's very much for us who are at the early stages of the adoption curve. All right, um, yellow hat, benefits. People, what do you think are some of the values and benefits? And I would love to hear some of you actually hear your voices. We can give you the microphone. It doesn't have to be me talking all the time. Anyone want to put their hand up? Go, Mark. Hi no, Joyce, thanks. I think this has been great so far, really comprehensive and really interesting. I was just going to, um, I'm not sure if it's under benefits, but say that we have had one, really only one lecture in our, at AUT that's taken up badges within their um, uh, course and they've used it comprehensively more as an internal accreditation micro-credentialing system than having any intention really for it to be an open badge. Um, and they've used it comprehensively through the course just to um, track students achieving certain levels of um, capability. So I don't know if you've got experience or, or know anything um, about the benefits of using badges as an internal system without really thinking of them as an open system. Um, yeah, I think, look, in terms of this kind of gamification, um, um, in terms of using them as gamification, so like a point system um, or a collection system that you do uh, in, inside your course design, I think there's absolutely spaces for them. But the question then is, um, do you want all of those badges to be exported? You know, and maybe by default they are exportable, um, but they you know, the, the students should be made aware that there's a difference between those little intermediate badges and the larger badge that they would get at the end of a course, for instance, because um, if we clutter the system too much with those badges, it can get really hard to see the trees of the forest, I think. But, um, but, I, think, um, uh, but I think that's... Um, <laughs> um, I think that, um, that there's definitely something to be said for that, and I know that at Michigan State University, uh, I heard someone present who uh, who was talking about how they used it, and this this lecturer always taught uh, his course in a way that there were many many more activities than the students actually had to pass, and students always participated really well. It was a journalism course; students were highly motivated, and um, uh, but when he added badges to it as just something you could collect. Um, uh, out of the, uh, all of a sudden, out of like the 19 activities that there were, which for just a summer course, um, students end up like, m most of the students end up doing 80% of them or more when the, the, the necessary um, uh, limit was something like 60% or something. So, so it's quite interesting. People can get, and I think this is what Lee's getting at as well with that whole idea of, you know, people starting to get badges just for the sake of badges. Um, and starting to get more focused on the object than actual on the journey to get there. Um, but um, yeah, I think I, I think they can work. They work motivationally for some people, and, and I think, like I said, for some for some people, and I think this is what Colin, where Colin's um, uh, comment goes to as well, which is um, this idea of searchable badges. For some people, they act as way markers. You know, what if there was something? Say a Spotify-like system where you could go in and um, you could look for badges, and, and, and it would read which badges you've already got, and then it would say, here are five other badges that you might want to strike out for. And so for me, as an experienced learning designer, it might say, we see that you've got some interest in UX. You might want to go for this wireframing badge next. You know? So um, I, think, I think that that would be a really 
Like that's the kind of system that I would be looking for. And I think it's the kind of system that we're heading towards, but, um, but it might be some way away. But that's me being the eternal optimist. I'm sure Lee would have different things to say about that. Um, Colin says, I'd like to be able to search for people that hold a particular badge. Yeah, and I think this is where we're going to see the real payoff in terms of corporate training and how corporates will be using these systems for sure, for sure, yeah. Sorry, Sue, we'll miss you, see you. Um, okay, so um, I realize that we've only got a few more minutes, so I will just quickly go through our last two hats. Uh, process of managing the kind of thinking process, focus, what are the next steps, what are action plans. Um, well, one of the action plans that I've got, that I've got for all of you is that, um, I will just copy and paste, is that you can go to credly.com and I'll just um, go there. Um, you get a badge. Uh, you can go to credly.com and you can go and earn a badge and this is your claim code. Now, are you going to let me paste? It's not going to let me paste, so I'm just going to have to type it in there. Um, e 3 f A. why is this not letting me write? All right, I'm going to type it in the chat window. Okay. So that is your claim code. That's through uh, Credly, and uh, you can just go to Credly.com. You can use that claim code, and um, and it will issue you with a badge. Ah, it's put it up there. I see. Um, uh, there we go. Um, and um, and it will just send you your badge. Or if you know you miss out on claim code, or there's a typo, then you can just email us at hello at academictribe.co, and you will get your badge, and um, you can see what it's like to actually claim that from Credly. Um, so that can be one of your next steps. Um, and the other is, you know, I'm always happy to to do like workshops or to talk or even just to chat to people about badges. Um, we also run the Open Badges Australia and New Zealand Community Group. Uh, these are these are groups that have kind of sprung up around the world, although we might have been the first. <laughs> um, but they're uh, they're basically just user groups of people that talk together. And we and because I've got an affiliation both in New Zealand and Australia, I decided that I would throw them together because I also think there's a lot that we can learn. Uh, from each other across the ditch. Um, last year we were running uh, we were running webinars like every two weeks. It got to be a little bit too much, but um, Becca, who's here today, has agreed to come on board and 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 possibly help us out with doing some facilitation. So we're going to have a few changes in how we run OBANs, but uh, but we aim to be back pretty soon. So you can follow us at um, on Twitter uh, at OBANs. Um, and you can also find us on Google Plus and YouTube and review, um, you can review all of the recordings of the sessions that we did last year. Alrighty, and then um, just a very final one, which is to think to, and we probably won't have time to do anything with this, but I would really like you to start thinking about the creative possibilities in badges and see places that you can actually start to use them and how they can spark new ideas. And, uh, you know, I've been using those sketch notes by, uh, by Brian Mathers, uh, but it really pays to go to his site and uh, because they, they capture in such a wonderful way the possibility that is actually inherent in the open badges. Um, so with that, I encourage you to go and uh, claim your slides and to stay connected with us and stay connected with Ascalite. And thanks, Mark and Alan, for setting this up today. It's been really good. Wow. Thank you so much, Joyce, uh, for that particular informative one-hour webinar. Um, we have come to the end of this session. And on behalf of Ascalite and everyone, thanks again, Joyce, for sharing with us. And um, for the rest of us, we hope that we are able to uh, you know, uh, inform you about the webinars uh, scheduled in the coming weeks. So hope to see you again at the next Escalate webinar. Bye for now.